The views expressed by the host of this podcast are not opinion-based or for entertainment purposes. They are actually facts and truth, no matter if other people like it or not. It is the Michigan sports truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. Hey there, Detroit sports fanatics, and welcome to episode 219 of the Michigan Sports Truth on Spreaker, the show that is honest and reveals the facts instead of just being les- lazy. I'm Taylor Phillips, live from my basement apartment office in the northern outskirts of McBain, Michigan, and with me on Facebook is Messenger, in, and with me on Facebook Messenger audio from the state of Georgia, as always, is my co-host Ed Smith. You can follow him on Twitter at Ed Smith three one three M at Ed, Ed Smith three one three, and Adam on Facebook is Edward Lawrence Smith, but he goes by Ed Smith. Thanks so much for being on here with me. How are you? Doing quite fine, Taylor. It's been a wild, crazy week for a lot of instances. Um, some of uh, lighthearted, some not so lighthearted. Uh, definitely, especially in the realm, in the realm of sports. Like, um, not many people thought Kevin Durant would go to Golden State. He did. <laughs> not many people bet that Dwayne Wade would leave Miami, let alone go to another team. He did, and that he went home to his home, went home to Chicago to the Bulls. And not that many people think that Brock Lesnar would come back to fight in MMA again, especially while under contract at WWE. But last night at UFC 200, he did. So a lot of crazy things that happened last week. So hard to imagine how that's going to be topped. But we shall see as we get to things here in, in a little bit here. All right. Uh, first off, we're going to talk a lot of Tigers here. Uh, we're going to recap. Their uh, series in Cleveland and in and in Toronto as well, and we're going to grade them on their first half of the 2016 MLB regular season. Then we're going to then we're going to tra- uh, um, segue into some Anthony Ghost news here. So, some a little bit a little bit of serious going on between uh, him and uh, the Toledo Mudhens manager Lloyd McClendon, and and, and then. Uh, we're going to transition to uh, the Red Wings, what they've done over the over the previous week, and and uh, what the Pistons did as well, as well as their as well as the recap of their summer games, which are which there are only four of them each year, and uh, a little bit of Lions and uh, college football in the mitten. But first off, it's Tiger time. Well, the Tigers uh, thought they were going to get swept by the Cleveland Indians yet again, but Michael Fulmer stood tall and the offense exploded in the uh, matinee series finale as the Tigers beat the Indians 12 to 2, but that was the only game that they could win. Michael Michael Fulmer pitched a good 6 innings. And uh the bullpen did the rest of the job. It, it, it was it was it was just a complete smoking of the Cleveland Indians who were who were 11 and 0 against the Tigers this year overall going into that game the Tigers had it just had to take their frustration out in some ways because they they're just tired of losing to the Cleveland Indians but but we understand that the Indians are are the uh, leaders of the American League Central Division and the Tigers are somewhere in the middle of the pack they're still in second right now they're in second place of the American League Central Division, and um, the Tigers are uh, desperately trying to uh, get get in get into the wild card. At, at least they're they're four back of the wild card, six and a half behind the Cleveland Indians. They're in a they're in a tight situation where um, where they don't they don't even know whether to buy or sell. But well. We'll include that in uh, five questions at the end of of this and each and every episode. But um, it, it it's uh, it, it's very true. the The streak has finally come to an end. But uh, the 
the Tigers offense uh, other than otherwise it has has struggled uh, except for that one game uh, throughout the entire week they they only took they also only took one of the four games against the Toronto Blue Jays in, in which Matt Boyd of all people get returned from from the Toledo Mud Hens and uh, improved his curveball and and picked up and uh, and uh, turn in a uh, good a, a very good performance. He gave up one run, but was robbed of of a win when Brad Osmus, that that idiot manager, put in Bruce Rondon in the seventh inning when the Tigers had a two one lead. Bruce Rondon gave up a home run on Independence Day. Brad Osmus put in Bruce Rondon in the seventh inning when it was tied at three, and Bruce Rondon gave up a blast, a two-run blast to Mike Napoli to put the Indians up five to three, and they won it by that final score on Independence Night after that two and two-hour twenty-minute rain delay. Uh, and and then uh, Anibal Sanchez got rocked twice again. He gave up. I don't know how many I don't I don't know how many runs uh, he he gave up, but uh, the, quite a quite a lot against the Cleveland Cleveland Indians, and then um, gave up five against uh, against the Toronto Blue Jays earlier Sunday afternoon in Toronto. Anibal Anibal Sanchez just cannot improve. Something's got to be done with him. Uh, Mark Lowe uh, gave up one run. On uh, Friday, but uh, he he still keeps allowing base runners. That's 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 one of the things that he still can't do. He still another thing he can't do is pitch shutout innings. That's what Mark Lowe can't do. And and uh, that that's that that's those are concerns here, not only in the starting rotation but in but in the bullpen as well. Most of the most of the bullpen has done done well, but Mark Lowe has been a disaster. Whereas mo- most of most of the starting rotation has done a fine job, whereas Anibal Sanchez has still become a virus bug for this for this for this season, uh, uh, despite his uh, past greatness, uh, 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 like uh, the the past few years. Even even uh, yeah one. All, despite his injuries in the past, but yeah, yeah despite that, you know, you know, the only reason that he he has a somewhat of a claim to us to any spot in starting rotation is the is the contract that he that he that he signed um, a couple of years back. So that's the only reason that's keeping him even uh, within the hair's race of trying to be in that starting rotation. But like like you mentioned, you know, they were trying to experiment, trying to move him to the bullpen. Now the two straight starts where he's given up at least five runs in both. I mean, he got clobbered for seven against Cleveland and gave up five uh, today against Toronto. He's gonna have probably more than likely put him right back in the bullpen because it's he can't keep this up. Look at it. I mean, for instance, like both those last two are last two outings, he lasted four innings. Whereas contrast that before beforehand, the other two starts against Miami and Tampa, he went one or two innings. Gave up minimal to no damage at all. Only two runs against Tampa, no runs against Miami, and then go back even further. Five runs against Cleveland, gets touched up for four runs. The start the game before that goes one inning against Seattle, no runs. So it's clearly evident, you know, the less work that Sanchez does, the less harm he can do to the team in terms of getting hit, you know, giving up hits, giving up runs, effectively getting putting his team out of reach. So in this sense, it's, uh, you have no choice but to put the put him move him to the bullpen and keep him there for as long, for a long time as possible. Um, this is a very very down week after last week. Seeing what how they start off the road went mm-hmm. uh, the road trip with a uh, a great a great series in Tampa. They included that cover behind win in the ninth. They swept that, but then only proceed to lose uh, five of their final seven games of the trip. They only went two and five of the final leg of their road trip and the final two series combined as we entered his all-star break uh you know they blew the first game against cleveland then they got smashed in that in the second game finally winning the third game finally getting a win over cleveland this year and then a complete embarrassment uh, losing three out of four against toronto 
Um, your offense barely showing up, if at all. Miguel Cabrera, I don't know what's going on with him. He's putting up decent numbers, but that's not to his liking. That's not to his status. It's not what we hold him to. You hope that gets better in the second half, but he's not having quite a good season as some would, would, would hope he did. Thankfully, Victor Martinez is picking up a little bit of the slack, but again, the offense was, you know, the team, you could tell that there are spots and keys here where you, they, they greatly, greatly miss J.D. Martinez, and the due to his elbow injury, you know, he essentially has a broken elbow, um, he's going to be out for at least a couple more weeks, so they got to find a way to um, uh, keep striving and trying to survive as much as possible until he gets back for 100%. Because missing J.D. Martinez is one reason why their offense has been, their offense has not been quite as um, consistent in uh, with, with the production uh, in the past several games here. Speaking of J.D. Martinez, I heard from uh, Kirk Gibson, the the uh, color commentator for the Tigers on on Fox Sports Detroit for that four game series in Toronto, that uh, J.D. Martinez. Will will uh, probably be back in about a couple more weeks from from his uh, radial neck injury in his elbow, and uh, that that can't come soon enough. Period. Yeah, I mean that's that's you know it was a little bit of a surprise to see the team do so well that do as well as they had without him. Uh, granted, you know you're beating up against weaker teams like like Miami and Seattle and Tampa, but hey, you're getting wins. You know, and this is just unfortunately, when you go against the likes of Cleveland and Kansas City and Toronto, you know, actual good teams, you know, you're seeing the difference in in quality here, to say the least. Definitely. So with that, um, the Tigers take their All Star break, and then they return home to play the defending World Series champion Kansas City Royals in a three game series on Friday. But um, let's uh, let's uh, briefly uh, go over the first half of the season. Um, the, the starting the starting pitching uh, had been a concern here and uh, at, at at a few times, but uh, the their bullpen ha- has showed up for most of the season, especially Francisco. Their closing pitcher Francisco Rodriguez, who who just keeps making saves, only blown two saves, but he's got. I, I believe twenty three or twenty four saves. Yeah, he's got twenty four. So 24. When you mentioned the fact that he's only blown a couple of save opportunities. Uh, that's a good number of consistency. You know, um, we thought we we had that a little bit in Joaquin Soria. And he, he started out what thirteen and zero or something, thirteen for thirteen, some similar to that fact with his save opportunities. Uh, fortunately, whittled a little bit down the stretch of his tenure before he was you know traded as part of the part of the fire sale last year. So it's good to see a little bit better consistency from our closer this year. Um, you'll, you would still hope to see better setup of the bullpen in general, and you would definitely hope to see, even though it's not situation, not safe situations. You want to see your 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 closer get as many innings as possible because there, there may be some instances where you know you're not going to be needed in blowouts, obviously. But if, if it's a close game or whatever, even if it's tied, you got to get him in there to at least you know make sure he just go completely. Um, cold, essentially. Uh, you would think Brad Osmus would have learned that by how he treated Joaquin Soria a couple times in 2014, uh, but unfortunately, it, it, I think it's obvious he still hasn't learned, which is a recurring thing with this moron. Yeah, and Brad Osmus still hasn't learned a damn thing. Uh, he keeps, uh, for example, he keeps putting Bruce Rondon in the seventh inning when it, in a close game. Whether whether it's tied or the Tigers had a have a one nothing lead or a two run lead, which, whichever. Shane Green was supposed to. Uh, Jeff Moss at, on Twitter at Jeff Moss DSR, the founder of the Detroit and uh, uh, founder co owner and uh, uh, the founder and owner and the uh, chief editor of the Detroit Sports Rag. He he said that Shane Green is the seventh inning guy, not Bruce Rondon. That's that's tr- that's true. I fully agree with that. Rondo can, should only be brought in as mere situation. Like, if you need to get a, get an out or whatever, just bring him in for them. Bring in Rondo right there. You can stuck on two outs. Get that out. Get out of the inning. He's not, you know, being being seen. He has not been seen in the past as being dependable enough 
to say, hey, we need you to carry a full inning for us. I think last year or the year before, he had a, a game in, in, in Tampa, I think. You know, he just looked uh, terrible. Uh, I think he either walked in or threw it, uh, or he got the bases loaded. He probably either walked the bases loaded, um, the, the, a run in or hit a bat or whatever. And he just flat out, he didn't have a good, uh, a good outing in there. And that happened because he was brought in to start that inning. So Rodon has shown he's not dependable when it comes to starting the innings. Uh, he's much more better when you bring him in to either, you know, get you through or get out of an inning. But Osmus, once again, you know, you would think he would learn better. That's two straight times he's been put in an inning to start. And what? He's given up the go-ahead, you know, or he's given up damage in each time. One instance, it was the essentially the game-winning home run against Cleveland. And what about that move on Friday night when uh, after Matt Boyd, after Mike Pelfrey uh, only, ge- uh, only gave up one run in five innings, Brad Osmus put in Kyle Ryan in the sixth inning, and um, at, and then Bobby Parnell, of all people, giving oh, up a three-run home run to to, an, to Edwin Encarnacion. That was a blasted dead center into the second deck in that six that nothing be, loss. That is that was the equivalent. That was the equivalent of putting in either Erickson or Cornwall when you have uh, Brendan Smith waiting on the bench. That's essentially what Osmus did here, and 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 it, and it cost his team. Cost the team again a game. That's like what the third, fourth, or fifth game uh, that Osmus, that the tactics of Osmus has cost the Tigers a game here. I'm pretty sure they wish they have a couple of those games back in terms of helping them out with the standings here. Yeah, um, that, it's just extremely um, aggravating. Uh, I mean, you, you, just like Jeff Blaschel. Uh, Brad Osmus and Jeff Blaschel have one thing in common: putting in the wrong guys in in uh, much needed situations when when the Tigers are down just one run, and 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 uh, their their pitchers, their relief pitchers, need to keep it close, and and have failed to do so about uh, pretty much almost every time. And uh, that that that. that that, that that's not good. That's a disaster. That's that's a problem. The, Brian Osmus uh, still still has faith in in those players, whereas Jeff Blaschel, where, uh, whereas Jeff Blaschel still has faith in Nicholas Cronwall and uh, Jonathan Erickson and, and all those other guys that can't get the job done. It, it's just aggravating, Ed. It's beyond frustrating. It's just simply beyond frustrating. And I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm starting to grow a little bit numb to it because what it's, it is what it is. I don't see as much as I like to see it happen. I don't see him firing Osmus until at the very least after the season is over. So maybe, like I said, they, they need to get a, another cold dose of reality. And once we see if we possibly not make the playoffs or have a chance to win, it, win in the wild card game, whatever, and Osmus does something stupid again, that'll probably be. Will your eyes see the light moment for the Tigers, and they'll have to get rid of this idiot? Yeah, I, I just have a feeling Brad Osmus will never change as a man, manager in the major leagues. Damn it! That uh, that that's that's how we both feel. That's that's how most Tiger, most loyal and yeah, smart I, Tiger I mean, fans feel. Most likely, that is what it looks like. I mean, we're going into what? Uh, we're, this is season three now. Okay, we should be well aware of what he's capable of and what he's not capable of, what are his strengths, what are his weaknesses, what can he do, and what he can't do. So I think it should be fairly obvious to us now. If it's if it's not going to change now, from his tactics or whatever, it's not going to change ever. Speaking of the All-Star break, um, Miguel Cabrera is the only was the only Tiger to make it to the All-Star game. Ian Kinsler was contending for the final vote, but he was in fourth place. Michael Saunders... Uh, won that final vote hands down. We knew it was going to happen We, as we looked at the standings, and so did the Tiger fans that that uh, that, that actually did look at the standings, uh, uh, regardless of how many times they kept voting for, for Ian Kinsler. They, it, it, just, it, it, just, it just didn't work, and uh, Ian Kinsler uh, had a horrible series against the uh, Blue Jays. He committed an error, which cost Justin Verlander... Uh, a short pitch count, 
just like just like he he committed that error that cost the Tigers a run in Oakland about a month ago, and uh, that's uh, I mean that's only Kinsler's Kinsler's made only four errors and made has made a nine ninety two and has a nine ninety two field fielding percentage. He's one of the best. I get it, but um, the, but uh, this his, his, his errors can't prove costly, accept, and that's yes, and that's aggravating yeah, too. Crucial timing. Exactly. It's it's not about how many you have them; it's when you have them. Like if you're a dude that has like fifty or so errors, but you don't, but you do it at inconsequential times or moments of during a game, that's something you can live with. But if you're 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 producing low numbers, but those errors are the ones that are are direct game changers or turning points or lead to you either winning or losing a game. Uh, that says something about you. Well, not about you, but uh, it's just um, a trend that you want to keep an, keep an eye on. You hope it doesn't fester into something more. No, no. You you, you just can't have that. Uh, that's uh, uh, air, Any error can prove can prove uh, anything costly like like a lead or a pitch count or uh, or um, a shutout or a no hitter or a perfect game uh, it, it can cost it can cost a, it, it can cost a, a team anything any team anything that I mean nobody's perfect but um, but 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 in crucial moments, you have to make those plays. You have to execute them. And and those two errors that Ian Kinsler um, made in Oakland and in Toronto were not were not were not execution. And and they and they both proved costly in two different in two different categories. And and, and they were both detrimental. And this it it doesn't matter what what kind of feeling percentage you have or or. And it doesn't matter how. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're the best or not. You have to prove it in in uh, crucial situations like like these, especially uh, in the middle innings. So uh, the All Star Game is at seven thirty on Tuesday, and the Home Run Derby at eight or eight thirty or nine, whatever. It's. Uh, it's going to be in San Diego at Petco Park, home of the Padres. Hope everyone enjoys that just for fun. A couple other Tigers news notes to to share with with our with our audience here. Uh, Anthony Ghost, former uh, uh, a former Tigers outfielder, still with the Toledo Mud Hens at in the AAA level. Was no showing at, at Toledo's game. Good man. Because um, he had uh, a heated argument with uh, Mud Hens manager Lloyd McClendon, formerly a manager of the Seattle Mariners and and the. Former Tigers hitting coach, uh, where where in the world was that link here? Just just one minute here. Uh, Anthony goes no shows at, at Toledo. Uh, that, uh, that it was it was due to it, it was due to a heated argument with the manager. Uh, Lloyd McClendon let Brad Osmus know about it, but did not did not uh, tell him any any further details of it. And uh, that's just. Shilling right there. Lloyd Lloyd Mc, Lloyd McClendon, uh, I believe, was too emotional about uh, to tell 
to tell Brad Ausmus or anybody else that. It was in the first inning of the uh, of that first game. It was a there was a fly ball hit in the air between Anthony Ghost and in right field, and uh, center fielder uh, Jacoby Jones. Ghost gave way to Jones, who dove but couldn't come up with the ball, resulting in a triple for uh, the hitter Tony Renda. Jones was was pulled from the game in the bottom of the first after hitting a pop up and getting a slow start to first base. And th- and then two innings later, McClendon and Ghost went at it, described as as a as quote a loud animated dugout argument. That that was from uh, Hardball Talk at uh, at uh, MLB.NBCSports.com, and um, that source came from George Sippel of the Detroit Free Press. Brad Osmus said uh, again, didn't know all the details because Lloyd McClendon didn't say anything. I- I'm not sure why Lloyd, Lloyd McClendon. Uh, the manager of, of a ball cl- of a minor league ball club wouldn't let wouldn't let the manager of a of a major league ball club know anything about it. That that that's that's actually called this is this is called a lack of responsibility by uh, both both by both managers, mostly Lloyd McClendon, but in the end Brad Osmus as well. Your take on that. <laughs> First and foremost, this is definitely an incident that does not uh, shine a good light uh, on Anthony Ghost. He's already, in my view, you know, got a little bit of a, a, a blight spot on him due to his comments about sabermetrics, or at the very least, defensive sabermetrics, um, with his, uh, I guess you could say, snobbish, arrogant view on it, uh, completely dis- all but essentially discrediting it. Um, you know, that's probably look at the fact that, you know, probably doesn't like uh, how some he has... I guess you could say a negative defensive rating uh, on all accounts from several analytics. Uh, and so now, factor in uh, this this new this, this incident that he got into an argument with his manager of his AAA club, and now decided uh, the next day or whatever to, to no show. Um, very speaks very poorly on your attitude. Um, speaks poorly on how you know you can't, can't really be trusted as a dependable teammate. And it just speaks poorly on, on your whole person, all your whole character as a whole. See, here's the thing. He's got that, good speed, but like, you know, it's after that, you know, he's got good speed, but he doesn't possess much after that. And when you have an attitude like that, it makes you look very expendable in some cases. Yeah, I mean, uh, Anthony Ghost, a uh, snotty player, uh he, 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 see, see. Keep in mind, he's a he's a guy that hates advanced metrics. It, I don't know. I don't know how it bothers him so many so many times. Um, it's just, it, just advanced me- metrics are very very valuable, and um, you you can't ignore that. And it's become an integral part of how you use strategy to help you put your team in better situations. Uh, in today's day, day and age of how we play, not just baseball, but in most sports, period. So to completely discredit something, discredit an essential tool is that um, just speaks of a very low uh, low maturity on, on some instances by, by ghosts, in my view. Yeah. You, you just can't have that kind of attitude, especially in the major leagues. Um you, you, you can't, you can't, you can't kick advanced uh, metrics to the curb, just in a disre- in a disrespectful manner. That's that's not professional at all. And what's especially not professional is to try to you know approve your worth, prove your you know prove how how tough you are by trying to get an argument with your manager, which surely is going to cause a lot of mixed signals in front of your locker room, like, hey, if you can do this, can I do it? And then when you factor in now that he no-showed on on Sunday's game, um, just a bad overall look on how you are as a character, as a person, and how how you could potentially be seen as a teammate in a negative way. 
Where is your honor, dirtbag? You are an absolute disgrace. Absolutely true. And and then we have uh, this other uh, Tigers news note here, news source here from uh, MLB Trade Rumors, headlining that the Tigers have signed Milwaukee Brewers outfielder Alex Presley to a minor league deal. I was thinking, uh, uh, no, well, somebody said to me that uh, he would be a good backup for J.D. Martinez because uh, Mike Avilas and Stephen Moy had been have been struggling as of late, and uh, that, that that's a concern. Moya. That, that makes the J.D. Martinez injury a lot more of a concern. Um, yeah, and and that's that's why the Tigers need a, need a new backup, and I think Alex Presley already signed to a minor league contract. He can still um, be called up to the majors and and uh, help out help out in, in right field. This was a move done purely for depth. Uh, you know, even though I like what what some of the power that Stephen Moy has shown in some games, it has been consistent. It has not been consistent. Uh, Mike Uvilas, what else needs to be said about him? So, yeah, you need to make a move for pure depth. Um this one, this is as close as you can get. Um, you know, Presley himself seems to be not quite of a uh, uh, offensive stalwart, herself, stalwart himself. Um, but, or at least when he was with Milwaukee, but he has shown in other places, I guess you could say, whether it be Pittsburgh, Minnesota, or Houston. Um, he has, I guess you could say, adequate, um, adequate level in terms of his hitting. Um, so I guess that that will be seen as, as a plus in his view if, if and when he's brought up. They'll you know, pass the time by until JD gets back. Oh yeah. Um, let, let's uh, uh, let me add something to the uh, first half of their uh, regular season here. The way that the way their offense has struggled. I've seen them over. I've swing. I've seen their hitters overswing and look away while they swing, in the process. And and uh, that's they're trying to swing for the fences and uh, trying to hit home runs. I mean, this is not a home run derby. This is a simple game of baseball, where uh, you have to uh, not necessarily hit hit the ball hard, but uh, pass pass the fielders. The infielders and the outfielders, you got you got to use skill hitting. Some sometimes you, you're going to need to play small ball. Sometimes you're going to need to uh, use your head to um, you know hit a line drive or a looper in between in between the infielders and the outfielders, and um, that it, it take it, it takes some uh, it. It takes a lot of practice, but uh, you got to get it together. You got to you got to be more consistent. You got you got to wait for the pitches in the strike Prime zone, example. whether they're fastballs or curveballs, sinkers, sliders, whichever. You've got yeah, to be more consistent. Will be, well, that will what we saw. Prime example will be what we saw that in uh, that comeback in the ninth inning against Tampa. You know they weren't going up there or trying to hit five run home runs or whatever. They just went up there, took their time, took some pitches, got on base with some walks. And then, like you saw, single, 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 like four or five straight singles, uh, eventually, which led up to that Cameron Maven double, which cleared the bases. You know, a, a, not a, a single home run was not needed during that entire comeback, or was not needed, rather, during the comeback, because what, they got all their, their runs uh, through singles, walks, and a double. So, you know, I wish you would think, hey, that's an example of good, timely, patient hitting, quality at bats, uh, from your whole team, why don't we get more of that spread out more uh, over these ga- over these over these games over next uh, versus these other teams? You thought that would help come in handy. Unfortunately, it didn't. No, because because they weren't consistent enough. That simple. So um, so we posted. Uh, so we found out uh, that uh, the, that uh, article from Bless You Boys um, pointing out advanced statistics, including fielding independent pitching on Mark Lowe, uh, the, the Tigers need to do something, 
need to uh, make a decision on Mark Lowe. Uh, I think because uh, uh, because we read that Mark Lowe had had very great numbers last year compared to this year where he had terrible numbers overall and and um, what I would I mean it's uh, very I mean um, I, I don't even know if Mark Lowe doesn't belong in Detroit or uh, something might have changed in him or uh, I think it's probably an adjustment year for him that's all I think an adjustment year so far trying to figure out okay what, what can I use what I can't use okay uh, uh, in terms of uh, trying to help progress throughout each through, through the inning and each outing uh, unfortunately just he hasn't gotten things to necessarily click in the right spots but I'd, I'd still say give it a little bit more time don't try to jump to too many conclusions yet not yet just not yet just like just you know wait it out just a little bit more yeah, I believe so, because uh, I, I would think uh, I would think what the Tigers should do is uh, send Mark Lowe down in the minors and let him work work something out there, whether it's Toledo, uh, whether it's Toledo Triple A or uh, the Double A Erie Sea Wolves. I think that would be better. That would uh, boost his confidence up bit. Something to help. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, something to help get, help him get his confidence back. For sure. Mm-hmm. So, uh, with all with all that covered, I guess uh, it, it's time to hit the ice. <laughs> the Red Wings made um, three moves today, or three headlines, in fact. They have re-signed Grand Rapids Griffins goaltender Jared Coro to a two-year extension. They've also filed for player-elected salary arbitration with goaltender Peter Morazic, their number one goaltender, meaning he's staying for one to two years, according to Kyle McElmer, Kyle McElmurray of Winging, the manager, the managing editor of Winging It in Motown from SB Nation. You can follow Kyle McElmurray at Kyle. W I I M on Twitter, and they have come close to agreeing with defenseman Danny DeKaiser on a multi-year deal. Uh, but uh, first off, let's get to the Danny DeKaiser stuff real quick. Just they're just trying. This is just another example of of uh, Ken Holland trying to keep all of his defensemen, uh, except Kyle Quincy, and. Uh, bringing in Alexei Marchenko to be that sixth defenseman. But uh, Danny DeKaiser, I think I think uh, it, the, the signing thereof is uh, probably, probably the last of, uh, uh, or possible signing thereof, is, is one of the last um, deals in, um, in the defenseman department that Ken Holland wants, wants to make right there. Yeah, you, like I said, I've, I've, I've uh, made my opinion known. I think he seems uh, quite settled and resigned to, to how he feels about uh, our issues with our defensemen. Um, instead of trying to bring in new people or, or new free agents or via free agency or trade, uh, he either lit a light of fire and needs some of these guys or just flat out uh, replace them. He just seems to content to just sit on his contract or whatever. And to let them uh, all, all for the sake of loyalty, and it's it, it's hurting the team. It's hurting our production on the ice, and it's hurting us in costly moments here. And then, and then uh, there's the other there's the other part, the goaltending situation. Uh, they they signed Coral to a two year extension, and, and then uh, lock up Morazic with the uh, arbitration stuff for you. For for a year or two, that that could indicate signs where it's more possible that the Red Wings could uh, trade their their other goaltender Jimmy Howard, which I like to call Jimmy Coward. But um, 
but uh, it's more possible. Jared Coro is signed to a two-year extension by, by the Red Wings, whereas Morazic is filed by the Red Wings for uh, club elected salary arbitration, meaning Morazic staying for, for one to two years with the Red Wings, meaning he's not going anywhere. Uh, not, not, not too, uh, well, not too least, soon. This could be seen at the, at the very least. This could be a move seen as just for pure purpose, depth purposes, like it was a few years ago. But we had uh, Howard Morassic and Gustafson. Now Gustafson uh, is uh, in Boston with the Bruins, being the backup to Tuka Rask. So I guess the Wings, knowing, seeing what Jimmy Howard did last year, he's shown, you know. There were some instances, okay, he had a good start, but for the most part, he was just flat out bad or terrible. So they want to try to ease up, ease up on that as much as possible while not trying to overexert uh, Morazic. So this is probably their way uh, by bringing up a, a, new, a new goaltender. So they have a, a three person rotation in set. Uh, and on some nights, yeah, you know Morazic's your number one. Yeah, how would you probably your number two? Now you have this person for your number three. Yep, that's uh, that, that's pretty much it for uh, the Red Wings here. Um, they they already got their all their forwards locked up, so we're gonna move on to the Pistons real real quick. Left side line three, and he answers. They have signed center Boban Marjanovic to a three-year, twenty-one million dollar offer sheet and contract, and. And and it's now official. Marjanovic is officially a Pistons be, a, a Piston because the San Antonio Spurs, which was his former team, which was former his former team, uh, could could not match that offer sheet. So it turns into a contract signing by the Pistons for Boban, and and um, he he's a he's a center that. He could be the center that the Pistons need right there. Yeah, it gives you uh, another needed issue for depth uh, with with your big men. Um, if there are some instances where you want to put, you want to bench Drummond, but you don't want to bring in uh, Aaron Baines, you can probably go the way of my, uh, Marjanovic here. He's seven foot three. I think he's currently the, the tallest player in the league. Um, you know, yet for all that size, he, he he's a bit nimble. You know. Uh, DetroitBadBoys.com, which is an SB Nation site for the Pistons, they, they, they detailed that Marjanovic, um, I believe last year or, or about his career, uh, shot 71% in the restricted area, 51% in the paint, and then 44% from mid-range to go along with 76% from free throws. Um, another valuable asset, asset that you want late in games, especially if you want to sit your terrible free throw shooter, Andre Drummond. Um... So that, that that could be something that draw that drew Stan Van Gundy's eye and his attention. Um, I, I've seen a little little bit of highlights of from what Marjanovic can do. Absolute, he can be an absolute beast in the paint, offensively and defensively. With that height, how can you not be unless you're Roy Hibbert? Um, and he's showing every once in a while breaks out a good mid range jumper, but primarily is used as an all around beast in the paint. Uh, think about what, like I said, you know. One good way to help you determine how far you can go in the playoffs, you need to have good, reliable work in the paint from at least one or two people. We saw that with Oklahoma City. Uh, obviously, we saw that with Cleveland. The Pistons, I think they're trying to mirror that a little bit. You know, you can have your your stretch four uh, with Luer and, and a little bit with Ellenson, but, but at the end of the day, you're going to need somebody else besides Andre Drummond to help you out in the paint and get you some boards. And with a guy like uh, Marjanovic, you know, granted, you know, for, at, at the start, it seems he'll probably be see a little bit of playing time, probably a little similar to what he saw than what we got, than uh, to what he got in San Antonio. But eventually, I could see him being brought in as as a replacement for Aaron Baines. And now, eventually, you're looking at a you're talking about a seven foot three guy as your backup center, and you have him on the contract for three years with an average for what seven mil per year. So again, you know, this is a good move that the Pistons made in my view, and didn't cost them too much money. Um, and, you know, if they didn't want to be too content to sit on the $9 million that they had left in cap space, they found a way to put it to work, and I think they got themselves a reliable piece in Marjanovic. Oh, yeah. And then there's summer league games. Uh, 
their summer league season got over with Friday Friday with uh, an 87-84 overtime loss to the Orlando Magic at uh, Amway Center. They before that they uh, they beat the Heat 71-58 on Thursday. They beat the Indiana Pacers 80 to 76 on two on Tuesday, and then um, they they beat the Magic 73-68 on Monday. So just a quick week of uh, summer league basketball in the NBA, just to uh, give you guys a heads up. So, um, so a uh, quick, quick uh, Lions uh, news update here. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! It is, it is finally confirmed. The Lions have released linebacker Stephen Tulloch. Um, it was reported uh, a while ago that that they released him, but it wasn't confirmed. But now it is. That's all I can say. And, and then, in college football... Touchdown, Michigan! Ed, you're going to love this. The Michigan Wolverines and the Notre Dame Fighting Irish have renewed their football rivalry for 2018, which is two years from now. And and uh, that, that's got to be a sweet feeling, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, it's it's the renewal of a, a very storied and very storied rivalry between two uh, the all time winningest programs, uh, depending on how you look at it in college football history. Two historic programs, uh, two two fan bases that do not like each other. Um, you know, it was a little bit you know, in a, in a way for, for for one of the other teams to loosen their their schedule with a big win early in the season. So, as all the ingredients. For a much needed aspect of, of uh, for your college football schedule and then overall for the game, so I'm very glad, very happy to see this happen. Uh, I think Notre Dame realizing what kind of a fever that Jim Harbaugh has brought on in only his first year in Ann Arbor with the potential to do more. They thought, okay, we gotta get a piece of that gravy train. Imagine those national televised games. Oh my! So you know, I don't blame Notre Dame for trying to get back into rivalries thing, uh, swing of things with that. Um, and you know, I'm just happy for it overall. Uh, very, uh, this gets a thumbs up for sure for me. All right, so with that, we go to five questions. Are you ready, Ed? Quite ready. So just let him rip, Taylor. It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth on Spreaker. Question number one. How would you grade the Tigers in the first half of the season? I would grade them a C plus or a B minus. I would I would say a C plus. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you on that. I would be leaning towards a C plus option. Um, you would hope they would probably do a little bit better. Granted, it's not so much an easy task because, like I said, you're dealing with the defending not just division champion but defending World Series champion. In your own division, so I get, I get it. You're you're going up a little bit against the gauntlet, so to speak, to start things out with. But Kansas City, they've had a bit of a struggle. You know, they haven't quite their usual selves. So you would think, okay, uh, they're filtering off a little bit. This will be our time to take over. But due in part to the Cleveland Indians, I got to give them the credit. They have done. They have played excellent team baseball throughout this first half. But also the fact that the Tigers, they either have bad luck with the injury of JD Martinez. Or just have bad manager, in in the case of Brad Osmus. So those two factors, more than anything, are preventing, and also bad play from 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 needed key players like Anibal Sanchez, etc. So when you factor all of that in, and how now, as of, as of now, as we said at the half, halfway mark, they're six and a half back out of first place, four games out of the wild card. Um, it's not terrible, but it's not where they need to be right now. It's not where they should be. They should be much better than this. So definitely, I agree with you in a C plus, almost leaning towards a, a middle of the road C here. I bet that that will be my grade. That is a medium average C. Oh yeah. Next question. Question number two: 
do the Tigers need to buy or sell? Because Jeff Moss uh, tweeted that um, if if they are still in that position in three weeks, you in, in the position they are right now, they they in three in the next three weeks they sell everything, including the kitchen sink. But if they're three back of the Indians, then they buy. And yeah, um, I'm, I'm yeah. Really leaning towards buy. To be honest, um, it's not so much a need to sell this year when compared to last year. Last year you needed to sell because you weren't going anywhere. It was the purpose of having all these guys locked up like Price and and, and, and it's Soria and whatnot. Um, especially when you were going to lose price anyway in free agency. So, better idea to sell now, get back what you can, to probably help you in, in a couple of years down the road or as early as the, the next season. So, you know, why go through all that again, you know, all that last year, only to do it all over again this year and set yourself back again? Um, you know, so I would say lean towards buy, because like I said, it's, it's still... You can find a way to work yourself out of this. You just win a couple of games, uh, get a little streak going of your own. You thought they had it going. But this, let's not remember, they did win, excuse me, the first four games of this road trip, but to be in prime position to make some noise as we close out the second half, out the first half here. So I would take solace in the fact that, you know, we haven't seen Miguel Cabrera begun to warm up yet. Once he does, look out. We haven't gotten J.D. Martinez back yet. Once he does, look out. So that's that's at least two factors that has, gives me some optimism that the Tigers can find a way to uh, make this as salvageable as possible. And I've I've, always, I've often said it, I'll say it again, when it comes to a 162-game baseball season, in most cases, often than not, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Next question. Question number three, should the Tigers get rid of Anthony Ghosts? Uh, he's not making a good case for himself. First with his immature uh, uh, statements, and now apparently with his immature actions. Uh, it, if it were me, I would at the very least suspend him, show some disciplinary action towards him. Um, you don't want to overreact per se and cut him out of pure spite, but you let him know, listen, this is, this is the line here, and if you continue to cross that line, consequences will be a result. So I don't say, you know, release him now or any any like that anything like that but do give him his fair his his warning his warning shot to say hey you keep on this is where you're going to be at next question question number four how can the pistons center boba boban marjanovic factor into the pistons roster and can he replace or be better than aaron baines well, first and foremost, with his size and height and how he moves around the paint, you know, he could be more versatile than Bain. So I eventually, uh, when you factor in that Bain more than likely will opt out next season, uh, that gives you a free open roster space. So I wouldn't mind seeing Martin Adovich plug up that, become your official backup center. Uh, I've mentioned before, with, his, with not just what he does in the paint, but also what he does in the free throw line, uh, who wouldn't want to have a guy like that at their disposal in, in, in their back pocket, per se? I have a friend who's a, who's a, who's a big, 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 big-time Spurs fan. You know, loves Spurs like I love the Tigers, essentially. Mm. Um, he's, he's oft, and he often referred to Marjanovic as, as a secret weapon of sorts. So it's kind of nice to know that we, steal, we stole that secret weapon uh, away from his spurs, so uh, yeah. So I, I really like, like I said, I really like the Marjanovic pickup. So we'll, we'll have to see where it goes. Next question, and finally, question number five: Can we see Peter Morazic and Jared Coro as a goaltending duo for the Red Wings at some point in the near future? I w- it wouldn't surprise me, especially if you know, like I said, if they actually go through with trading Jimmy Howard or uh, Minimalot, uh, Minimalot minimize, excuse me, minimize more of his starts and playing time to make room uh, for, for, the, for this new addition. So it wouldn't surprise me in the near future if, if that were to happen, but if they want to go with the safe route, go with the you know, three-man rotation so you can split up the time between your reserves while giving uh, your starter enough rest possible so you don't override him it's, you know, you're right. Just start your third guy instead of your second, instead of your first guy when you want when you don't feel confident in your second guy, or vice versa. So you can prolong uh, your number one for the playoffs. All right. 
for all the listeners and the fans out there, if you want to answer those questions, just replay the episode and answer them in the comment bank below this episode. That wraps up episode 219 of the Michigan Sports Truth. Ed, thanks so much again for your help. I'll talk to you again on episode 220. We can, uh, If we could do this next week, we could still cover uh, the Tigers series against the Kansas City Royals at least, and, and uh, maybe... Maybe some uh, breaking. Maybe some. We'll cover some uh, breaking news uh, uh, that that actually happened o- over the week. Probably free agency, or whatever. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're, with regards to free agency, or whether the case may be in the NBA, that's I mean, going to yeah, continue. At the very least, you know, discuss whether or not the Tigers, uh, you know, kicked off their second half of the bang, or they're leading their own death march. Oh yeah, or or getting in the middle, in between the. The, the, the both of the, those ends here. So uh, I'll, I'll talk to you next week, Ed. Yep, looking forward to it, Taylor. Take care. Yep, take care. And Fred Smith, I'm Taylor Phillips. Is if there's anything you fans want more of or less of on our podcast, please let us know. Follow us on Twitter at dt 2 Phillips with two L's and at Ed Smith three one three. TTFN, ta-ta for now. Bon appétit.